conventional wisdom or conventional opinion says that when a father or a mother speaks to the child or to the teenager, that the children basically don't want to hear it. They don't want the father-son talk. They don't want the mother-daughter conversation. They rebel. They resist. But upon further investigation, when you take a closer look, it's more like the children resent an adult conversation, but they thrive on a father or mother conversation. Do we come across to our children, do we come across as a father, as a mother, or do we come across as an adult? The difference is huge. We spoke about this at the uh, Chabad of Minnetonka, and it sounded something like this. I guess it's true of family as with everything else. Growing, progressing, increasing, improving is a sign of life. Stagnation is not a sign of life and therefore not healthy. So in family relations, it's not enough to have a good relationship, a functional relationship, an acceptable relationship. It's got to be a growing relationship. It's got to improve. Things get better, or, or they get worse. It's always healthy, it's always helpful to find new insight, greater insight, greater resources of energy and feeling and devotion and pleasure. Because above everything else, beyond everything else, family is supposed to produce pleasure. Which is why when family relationships produce pain, it's so intolerable and objectionable and shocking. What's supposed to produce pleasure is producing pain. That's not good. I think I've mentioned this once before. We have in our lives both love and pleasure. Both are essential. And often these two emotions are embodied, personified, in a human being. So the expression, the love of your life. Someone is the love of your life. Which means that all your love is centered and focused on this one person. Well, not maybe, maybe not all your love. You can still love other people. But this is where your love flourishes. This is the love of your life. Well, the same is true also of pleasure. That a person can be the pleasure of your life. And I think I mentioned this, that at the beginning, in the early years of a marriage, your spouse is the love of your life. In the later years, the spouse becomes the pleasure of your life. Because love is a pursuit. And after, let's say... Uh, 45, 50 years of marriage, the pursuit is over. <laughs> you got there. It's done. So now it shifts to pleasure. You become the pleasure of each other's lives, and therefore you can't live without each other. Because without the other, without the spouse, life has no pleasure, which is, which is dangerous, physically dangerous, to live without pleasure. So, family is supposed to represent the embodiment of the pleasure of your life. That's where pleasure is supposed to be secure and safe and predictable. That no matter what else happens in your life, you can always go home and there you will find pleasure. And that's why it's worth every effort and every hour and every uh, discussion on the subject to increase our enjoyment and our pleasure in our family, no matter how good it's been until now, and certainly if it hasn't been so, like, you know, perfect. So to improve it and to get more pleasure out of it is certainly a worthy effort. Let me start here with a story. 
And of course, there are so many practical questions and issues that are covered in so many different ways and so many different books by so many different authorities and, and authors and so on. I want to find something like maybe a little different, original or unique, that can spark some new thoughts and creativity in our mind and heart. The first Lubavitcher Rebbe, of Schneir Zalman, would read the Torah himself at, in his congregation. He had a son who later became the second Lubavitcher Rebbe, his successor, who was a very sensitive soul, the son. Now, twice a year in the Torah, we come across uh, sections where God is describing the dire consequences of our misbehavior. Or even if we don't misbehave, they're going to happen anyway. There's going to be bad times. Moshe says to the people, you're going to come into the land and you're going to settle in and you're going to get comfortable and you're going to get sloppy and lazy and it's going to be bad. And it goes on and on and on, verse after verse, sentence after sentence, chapter after chapter, how bad it's going to be. You're going to be destroyed, you're going to be decimated, you're going to be driven crazy, you're going to be scattered to the four corners of the heavens, you're going to be diminished to a fraction of your number, you're going to starve. You're... Horrible, horrible and very vivid descriptions of suffering and of punishment and so on. The custom is that you don't call anyone up for the Aliyah when you read that chapter. The reader just reads it. But you don't call anyone up because you know nobody wants to be <laughs> really heavy, heavy descriptions basically of Holocaust. One year when the Rebbe's son was in his teens, he was about 17, but a fully mature human being, as they were in those days. One Shabbos, his father, the Alter Rebbe, was not home. He was, he was away. And someone else read the Torah. And it was that portion, the Teichacha. And halfway through that chapter, the Rebbe's son fainted. He, he, couldn't, he couldn't listen to it. It was horrible. He fainted. And he was so weakened, he was so traumatized by it, that months later, when Yom Kippur came, they had to consult a doctor to determine whether it was safe for him to fast. So they asked him afterwards, you've heard this read so many times in 17 years. You never fainted before. What happened? So he said, this is the first time I heard it read by someone other than my father. When my father reads it, it sounds like blessings. The Rebbe spoke about this at length one time. And he said, what is the relevance of this story to us? The Alter Rebbe is not our father. And the Rebbe generalized the principle to include all human beings. It wasn't that the Alter Rebbe was special. And when he read it, it sounded like blessings because then it wouldn't be relevant to us all these years later. What it meant, the story being related to us, it means when you hear the Father behind the words, then it sounds like blessings. But when you don't feel or hear the fatherliness behind the words, it sounds really bad. I had this missionary once, who was giving me, she was Jewish actually, and she was giving me this whole thing about God is love. But behind it all, she was very frightened. I asked her if she would want to do a mitzvah. She was frightened. I asked her if she would want to come and study. She was scared. For a person who believes in a God who is only purely love, you're a frightened person. And she says, well, I was taught that if you um, come into Christianity and then drop out, then the suffering is even worse than if you were never in. 
I didn't understand that because if you're not in, you have eternal damnation. What could be worse? <laughs> you can't get any longer than that. But anyway, she was very frightened. So I said, I want to show you something. And I took out the Chumash with an English translation, and I opened up to that portion. I said, have you ever read through the Chumash from cover to cover? She had never read through it. I said, read this. She starts reading a few paragraphs, and she says, oh, my, this is bad. I said, just warming up. Get into it. It gets worse. <laughs> so she reads through the whole thing, and it's just horrible. Finally, she hands it back to me like she doesn't want to touch it. She says, this is, this is horrible. I said, yeah, we read it twice a year. You know what we do after we finish reading? What do we do after we finish reading those horrible chapters? We go to the Kiddush. We eat, you know. <laughs> That's what Jews do. You make Kiddush, you go, you have some herring. How come, how come people don't faint? How come people don't drop out, run away, hide in the cave? Scary stuff. We read it and we say, oh, good Shabbos, good Shabbos. <laughs> how come we're not frightened? Here, God is not saying, I'm love, I'm all love, everything is love. God is saying, oh yeah, you're going to get it. And we say, oh, that's bad, let's eat. <laughs> Why aren't we intimidated? Well, part of the reason is because we don't listen. <laughs> but the other reason is, we hear, we hear the Father. Who's saying this? God is saying this. God is saying, I'm going to be angry and I'm going to wipe you out. Oh, come on. He's a father. He's in a bad mood. Don't worry about it. He's a father. So if a father sounds really angry, so tomorrow, come back. It'll be all right. If you hear the father, if you just hear the words, oh, the words are horrible. Terrible words. When we talk to our children... We can either come across as a father or we come across in words, in some other role, in some other identity. Generally speaking, when we respond to our children as a reflex, you know, they're getting on your nerves and you say something. You don't sound like a father. You don't sound like a mother. You sound like an irritated adult. There's no father in those words. There's no mother in those words. And then the words are curses, horrible, threatening curses to the child. And sometimes it's even as subtle or as innocuous as, stop biting your nails. It's a curse. What did you say? I mean, you're giving him good advice. He really should stop biting his nails. Or, or, you know, or stop uh, eating with, uh, talking with your mouth open. Or, I mean, these are, wait, what, this is threatening? If it doesn't sound motherly or fatherly, then it is threatening. Then it's a curse. On the other hand, even if you're saying some very harsh, critical things, but it sounds like there's a father in those words, then they're a blessing. Somebody else would find them harsh. But the child hears the father, and, to, and that's a blessing. Uh, like in the, the, words of, the words of the Bardichever song, he composed a little song to God. And basically what he says is, everything is you. Wherever I go, there's you. East is you, west is you, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then he says, when things are good, that's you. When things are maybe not so, not so good, that's you. And as long as it's you, it's good. So that even a punishment, but if it's a fatherly punishment or a motherly punishment, it's good. It feels like a blessing. We know this today from our experiment with permissiveness. Children who are not disciplined and who are never told harsh words or consequences are not happy children. 
They're not healthy children. And when they finally are told firmly and strongly, this is how you have to behave, they love it. Because then it sounds fatherly. And when it's fatherly, it's a blessing. Feels like a blessing, sounds like a blessing. It is a blessing. So here's the point. In a relationship, we have to wear many hats. Sometimes you have to be the teacher of your children. Sometimes you have to be the policeman. Sometimes you have to be the judge and the jury. Sometimes you have to be the executor. <laughs> Sometimes you have to be the nurse, the psychologist. You've got to wear many, many hats. But only the hat should change, not the person. Whatever hat we're wearing, it has to feel like a father. Like in the Torah. There are chapters where God is promising us the land of milk and honey and eternal bliss. And then there are times when he's telling us that he's had it with us and we're getting on his nerves and we're a stiff-necked people and we're impossible to deal with. Because then we turn to the next chapter and he says, yeah, so, keep Shabbos. I say, oh, so things are okay, right? We're impossible, but you're still talking to us and we're still in... All right, that's okay. So... The person behind those hats, in those hats, under those hats, has to be consistent. You have to be one person wearing many hats. So that the father always comes through, or the mother always comes through. The same is true on the other end of the relationship. When we try to reconcile our feelings and our attitude towards our parents. There are times, I'm sure, that our parents said or did things that feel like a real curse. It was harsh, it was condemning, it was rejecting, it was critical, it was maybe even malicious. So how do we reconcile our feelings or our relationship to our parents without going home and starting all over again, which is not practical or advisable? We've got to look into those very words and find the father in them. Find the mother in them. Because going back to that story, the fact that the Rebbe was reading and he was being fatherly about it is not enough. Because, you see, everybody else was listening when the Rebbe read and they heard curses, which is why they didn't faint when somebody else read it. It's the same curses. They've heard it before. Only his son fainted because when his father read, he heard the father. Nobody else in the room did. Everybody else heard curses. And it's not just because he was physically his father, but because he was a special person himself and could tune in to the fatherly element, to the fatherly essence behind those curses. So when we want to reconcile our relationship with our parents, we have to do the same thing. We have to be like the Rebbe's son and hear the father in the words, in the actions, behind the actions. And in that way, we basically salvage our relationship. I have a father. He did this, he said that, but I have a father. And even when he was doing those things, he was the father and remains my father. And suddenly the curses don't feel so terrible. And eventually they start, they start to feel like a blessing. To have had a father who was critical and harsh is a blessing. Because not to have a father is completely unacceptable. I'll tell you the story. I was a little kid. My, father, my parents took me to the doctor. Maybe it was my first visit to a doctor. So it left an impression on me. Going to this doctor's office, this was back in Borough Park, I think it was. And this is the old fashioned doctors, you know, they didn't have any equipment, they didn't have machines. It was all done by, uh, by the art of medicine, not by the science. And I think he was probably from the old country also, so spoke Yiddish. And so on. Anyway, I go into the office, 
And I'm sitting there, and this doctor, who had no sense of humor whatsoever, <laughs> says to me, so what is your problem? I said, my stomach. That stomach aches. Now I know it was the school, not my stomach, but then I thought it was my stomach. Anyways, I said, my stomach. And he, he launches into a tirade. He says, a stomach is not a problem. If you don't have a stomach, it's a problem. <laughs> I didn't know I was going to a psychiatrist. <laughs> and he just went on and on and on. And, but he's right. A stomach is never a problem. Even when it's giving you a problem, it's better to have a stomach than not to, <laughs> to, The stomach is never the problem. So a father is never a problem, even when he's giving you a problem. Because not having a father, that's a problem. So finding the father behind whatever it was, is always a blessing. It's just that sometimes we're too young to be able to discern, because discernment comes with age and with wisdom. And when we're young, we're not able to discern the harshness of the words from the fatherly essence behind them. But as we get older, we can start to peel away some of those layers the words were harsh. Peel away the word. Even the action was a little harsh, very harsh. Peel away the action. What have you got left? So even if a father is wearing the wrong hat, a hard hat, <laughs> a demolition hat, and he's destroying your life, it's a hat. Who's under the hat? If we can find the father under the hat, then we discover the blessings that sounded and felt like curses. And that's enough to put your life back on track. Even if you never talk to your father again, or can't talk to your father or mother. When you peel away the hat and you find the father, that's all you needed. You're in good shape. Because not having a father, that's a problem. So this story is really like... Uh, the perfect metaphor for finding the pleasure that is essential to these relationships. Having a father is the pleasure of your life, very early in life. It never goes away. Having a mother, I mean, a Yiddish mama, goes without saying that this is the pleasure of your life. And uh, even when you get married, and you find a new pleasure in your life, it doesn't replace or displace the old pleasures. And they don't, they don't become any less necessary. It's just that your time is spent differently. When you're married, you spend your time taking care of your new family. You don't have as much time to spend with the parents. But that doesn't change the pleasure factor. So that even if they're far away, even if they're gone from this world, you can reclaim the relationship by taking off the hat and finding the father beneath it. And that's all you really need. Now, to make it easier for our children, who maybe don't have the power of discernment, why confuse them? Why talk as if you're not a father and hope that they'll figure it out? And that's what we do, basically. Sometimes fathers will say, this hurts me more than it hurts you. Why do they say that? Because we're afraid that the children don't realize this. And then they're going to forget that this is a father. And they're not going to know that this is coming from a father. Well, if you're afraid that they might misunderstand, then be clear. Don't give confusing messages. Don't wear a hat that is such a good disguise that your own child doesn't recognize you which is what's so traumatizing to the child. To see your own father in a disguise that is so foreign that they don't recognize you, at least for the moment. That's very scary. So how do we do that? A few practical things. Number one, if you're going to respond on the spur of the moment with a reflex reaction, 
it's a pretty safe bet to say that your children are not going to feel anything fatherly or motherly in that response. Because it's not coming from the father in you, it's coming from the impatience, from the uh, irritation, not from the father, not from the tata. And in order to come across as a father, no matter what it is you say, no matter what it is you do, if it's premeditated, it's more likely that it's coming from the father in you. Because who else thinks about this child when the child is not irritating you? <laughs> no stranger is walking around thinking about this child, unless the child is sitting in the seat in front of you on the airplane, <laughs> making you wish <laughs> that you never got on that flight. But otherwise, why would anybody be thinking about your child? On the other hand, when the child is not irritating you, but you're thinking about the child, well, what does that mean? It means you're the parent. Why else would you be thinking about the child when you're in a good mood? Because you're a mother, because you're a father, that's why. And then whatever it is you're going to say afterwards, whatever it is, somehow the child is going to sense intuitively, that sounds like a father. That sounds like a mother. Because it's not a reflex. So the first rule is, be thoughtful. Mindful is what they call it today. Be mindful in your relationship with your children because that's when your motherhood or fatherhood comes across best. If you do make a off-the-cuff remark or a reflex a reaction or something, go back and fix it. Don't let it go. Put some thought into it and then go back and fix it. It doesn't mean you have to apologize. It means you have to complete the picture. When the kid was getting on your nerves, you said, be quiet, get out of the room. That's not a complete lesson. <laughs> it needs a little more something to make it a real lesson in life. So you've got to come back and say, you know when I told you to get out of the room, and say something, even if it's critical. But it's thoughtful, and the child is going to feel like he has a father. In fact, sometimes you actually hear it in children. You hear a child say to his friend, my father doesn't let me. And you wonder, what's he so happy about? Your father doesn't let you. Oh, that's very sad. No, he's not sad. And he's talking to his friends, and they're going to do something, and he says, oh, my father doesn't let me. What's he happy about? Because he has a father. And sometimes a father doesn't let. Well, that's okay, too. It's not a curse. That's a blessing, too. The first thing is thoughtfulness. The second thing is style. How do you do it? How do you say it? The wisest statement can be wasted. The best intentioned lesson and wisdom can be wasted and can actually be counterproductive, depending on how you do it. How do you do it? If you do it from across the room, you just throw some wisdom at your kid, it's wasted. It's wasted. It deserves a better setting than that. If you do it with your back to the child, it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit. When the Kohanim bless the people, there's a condition. The condition is that the people have to be facing him. Or has to be facing the people. People behind him are not included in the blessing. Even though he might intend to include them. They're not included because they're not standing in front of him. Why is that so crucial? It's the nature of a blessing that it, it is exchanged face to face. It is the nature of rejection that it is done back to back. So 
the behavior or the physical expression has to match what it is you're doing. If you're giving a blessing, it should be face to face. If you're rejecting and walking away, well, then it's, then it's back to back. So when you're giving wisdom, wisdom has a certain character, wisdom has a certain nature, and it has certain demands. And one of the demands is that it be presented in a manner that is also wise. Wisdom wants wise expressions, wise methods of communication. One of those conditions, one of those methods, is waiting for the child to ask. In other words, waiting for a time when the child is completely focused, not distracted. How do we know he's focused? He's asking. Then you know that he's going to listen to your answer. That is a good setting. That's a good moment to capture in which to deliver the wisdom that you've prepared or intended or have been waiting to share with your child. Another is the tone. There is a tone that is appropriate for wisdom. And there's a tone that's inappropriate. Obviously, a hysterical tone does not convey wisdom. As the Gemara says, the words of the wise are heard gently. A wise person speaks calmly because that's the nature of wisdom. A hysterical voice is expressing emotion, not wisdom. And sometimes a hysterical voice is highly appropriate. Like, fire! <laughs> you don't say that with a lot of wisdom. You say that with a lot of panic. Because then it's appropriate. But when you're, when you're sharing wisdom, but it sounds like you're, <laughs> like you're warning people of a, of a nuclear fallout, it doesn't work. Something's incongruous. The ear doesn't know what to make of it. So it blocks the whole thing out. And of course, that's true in all good communication. The tone has to match the content of what you're saying. Another thing is the expressions. What words do you use? You want to tell a child that, um, that it's very noble to be tolerant of other people. And you can say, you know, even if your friend is a real jerk, you know, like idiot, you still, you should, you've ruined the whole thing. You've ruined it. Because the choice of words contradicts the content of what you're saying. Somebody once told me that they went to a lecture on modesty, on sniut, on, on modest dressing, on modest behavior. Came away disappointed. I said, why? A good subject. I said, well, the subject was good, but he spoke so immodestly about modesty that I couldn't listen. He was too vulgar in his description of modesty. So it was the wrong expressions. And that's why you have these memorable bits of wisdom that stick in your mind because they were, they were crafted into a rhyme or into a memorable kind of a expression. When you hear a profound new insight into a familiar old verse that is so memorable. Like if somebody would come along and, and give you a whole new insight into manishtana, that would be memorable because the words already exist in your vocabulary, in your mind. You're familiar with them. And to find a whole new meaning in familiar words, you see, that works. And maybe, and maybe that's why the sages kept using the same expressions over and over again, but always with a new insight. Because it works. It's memorable. So when you want to convey a message to a child that is a little bit more mature than the child is, 
because otherwise you're not making any progress. But if you can also deliver that message in a rhyme, in a story, in a song that the child is already familiar with, but never realized the wisdom, that is so much more effective than suddenly throwing at the child a whole new vocabulary. And he's got to work out the words before he gets to the content, because he never heard those words before. Now, in Judaism, when you're teaching Torah, this is also crucial. For example, when a child is being malicious and putting down another child to others, there are people who will come over to their child and say, oh, you mustn't say that it's Lashon Hara. The kid doesn't know what Lashon Hara means. So you say, no, it's Lashon Hara. It's, it's, it's evil talk. It's not nice to talk like that. Well, the kid is still trying to figure out la, 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 what, la, what? And, and he forgot that you said you're not supposed to talk like that. Because he's working out these new words he's never heard before. And that's why the kids get so frustrated. And eventually they resent any Hebrew expression. Because later on you're going to tell them, no, you can't have that. It's milachik. They hate it. Why? What did I say? Oh, it's one of those things like la la, what that la la la, right, that other one. They hate it because you're telling them something important that they should know, and you keep putting it into a language they don't understand, which frustrates them, and so they resent it. This kid whose father had become religious much to the teenager's chagrin, came home one day and asked her father a simple question. If there's a God in the world, why do bad things happen? And the father told her something. She didn't hear a word he was saying. And she told me later. She tuned him out. She didn't hear a word he was saying. Because what he said was really good. Because when I repeated it to her, she said, oh, that's... I said, but your father said that. She said, I wasn't listening. And why wasn't she listening? Because her father said, in response to her question, he said, oh, I once heard a very good Dvar Torah about that. She said, a what? And that's it. He lost her. It wasn't a Dvar Torah. It was an answer to her question. Why do you have to call it something in a strange language? It was a perfect opportunity. She had asked a question. She was willing to hear. He had a good answer. And it didn't work. Because he threw in a couple of words that were just inappropriate and ruined everything. So pick the words carefully. The fact that you choose your words, the fact that you choose the timing, the fact that you choose the content, and the fact that you bother delivering it, all that feels like a blessing. That feels like a father. That feels like a mother. And then even if you have to say things really harsh, child will love you forever and will repeat it to his children. And it becomes the wisdom of the ages because it goes from generation to generation to generation because it's, it's real wisdom. Here's a little bit of wisdom. Just heard it. If you lose your money, you've lost nothing. Money comes, money goes. If you lose your health, you've lost something. person needs to be healthy. If you lose your purpose, You've lost everything. Because without a purpose, even health and money are useless. Isn't that good? I bet you if I go home today and I say, Hey, kids, come here. I heard something really nice. You want to hear it? It's like, you know, if you lose your money, you will... they'll, they'll look at me like, <laughs> What's wrong with this guy? But I'm telling them something so good. It's quotable, it's memorable, it's wisdom, it's encouraging, it's enlightening, it, it's wonderful. I just told you something wonderful. Wasted, useless. 
And if I try it again later, when they are listening, they'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, you told us that. So now it'll never work again. It's ruined forever. <laughs> I've got to wait 10 years until I'm sure they won't remember that I ever said it. <laughs> but if I wait for the opportunity, which I will do, I will wait for the opportunity. And one of these days, somebody's going to say something about uh, giving up hope or becoming indifferent. Who cares? And I'm going to say, you know, if you lose your money, you really haven't lost anything. If you lose your health, you've lost something. But if you stop caring, you've lost everything. And they're going to think I'm so smart. <laughs> And that's because I waited for the right moment. So the expression is good. It's put in a memorable form. And I can say, you know, if you lose your hope, what have you got left? All right, I'm saying the same thing, but it's not going to be as memorable. It's also not going to be helpful when he loses his money. <laughs> and he's depressed about it. But if I tell it to him correctly and properly then it'll cover all three. If he should ever have to lose all of his money, he won't get depressed because he'll remember, if you lose your money, you've lost nothing. It comes, it goes, it'll come again. Don't worry about it. So pick the moment, pick the idea, pick the expression. Your children will love you. They will quote you to your grandchildren, and that's worth everything. <laughs> To hear your children quote you to your grand... You don't know what that feels like. I mean, it makes life worth living. It means your life was not wasted. And if you do that, in keeping with our theme, if you do that, if you practice that, if you are mindfully maternal or mindfully paternal with your children, you get to like them in addition to loving them. Whereas if you keep running into these verbal roadblocks, if you keep running into these uh, head-on collisions where you're trying to say something but it doesn't work and they're not listening, and it's hard to like them as much as you love them. But when this method of interaction is applied, you get to like them. You get to enjoy talking to them. Because when you talk, it works. It feels good. And then they like to hear what you have to say. That feels very good. Imagine kids who really want to hear what you have to say. That would be very nice. And so in addition to loving them, you get to like them. And the same is true, of course, with our parents, with our spouses. If you're not constantly butting heads because you used the wrong word, you didn't wait for the right time, or you didn't think what you were saying and it's not very wise, how are you going to like them? You know, if you can't talk to somebody, how do you like, how can you like someone you can't talk to? You love them, but how do you like them? So practice this and see what happens. Premeditated wisdom which is fatherly and motherly. Can't go wrong. Can't go wrong. It's worked for 5,000 years. <laughs>